Hello and welcome to the second in the National Law Center's series of webinars uh, for the Data Driven Justice Initiative, uh, hosted by the, uh, the White House and the National Association of Counties. Um, today we are very excited to be sharing success stories of constructive alternatives to criminalizing homelessness. Um, uh, I'm here together with uh, my colleague, Tristia Bauman. Um, <clears throat> both of us are senior attorneys here at the National Law Center, uh, which is the legal arm of the nationwide movement to end and prevent homelessness, uh, working to uh, prevent and end homelessness through uh, policy, advocacy, uh, outreach, and education, and impact litigation. Uh, we are happy to announce this week that uh, a few weeks ago we launched our National Housing Not Handcuffs campaign, uh, which we invite everybody to join by going to housing.handcuffs.org. Um, this is a, a national campaign to shift resources from criminal justice solutions uh, to uh, housing, uh, which works to uh, successfully end homelessness, much more so than uh, using the criminal justice system. Uh, so very much in line with uh, the goals of the National Data Driven Justice Initiative. Um, you can find out more about the campaign on our website, housing.handcuffs.org, and um, uh, you can also uh, endorse the campaign there and, um, uh, and uh, see who else has endorsed. We have several high-profile endorsements already, um, including from uh, Eric Holder, uh, the former Attorney General, um, and some of the, the communities on who are on the, the conference call today. Um, and this is important, as we know, because homeless people um, are much more likely than the general population to be cycled through uh, the system of uh, incarceration and uh, as well as the, the healthcare system uh, needlessly and expensively. Um, and in addition to launching our campaign last week, uh, or two weeks ago, uh, we also issued a new report on criminalization of homelessness and constructive alternatives, uh, again, highlighting many of the communities on the, the, who will be presenting today. Um, that report was authored by Tristia Bauman, who's also on the line. And Tristia, I don't know if you want to say a word or two about the report. Sure, thank you, Eric. Uh, the Law Center has been tracking a core set of 187 cities since 2006, reviewing the laws that are on their books that prohibit or restrict the life-sustaining activities of homeless people. I'm referring to activities uh, that are engaged in by all human beings, but are civilly or criminally punished when performed in public places, things like sitting down, sleeping, uh, storing needed belongings, like clothing, medication, uh, and what we found is that over the past 10 years there has been a dramatic rise in laws that punish the uh, life-sustaining activities of homeless people when performed in public spaces. Uh, you can read more about it in our report. A couple of increases that I'll highlight is that laws restricting living in vehicles have increased by 143% over the last 10 years, and laws restricting uh, camping in public, which are laws often written broadly to include merely sleeping in public or even sitting with one's belongings in public spaces, uh, have increased by over 60%. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone who is interested to read the report about the problem and also uh, about some of the solutions that you'll hear more of today. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Um, so with that, uh, we're excited to jump into the webinar. We've got, uh, as I said, a really broad range of presenters um, from cities all across the country who are uh, implementing these successful constructive alternatives to uh, criminalizing homelessness, uh, ranging uh, from uh, Sam Dodge at the San Francisco Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, Paul Driscoll and Melissa Marone from Syracuse, New York, uh, Alisha Herrick Blaine from uh, the National League of Cities, Anthony Haro and Jeff Youngman in Columbia or Charleston, South Carolina, and Alan Witchie uh, at in Indianapolis. Um, so we'll hear from each of them uh, in turn, 
uh, and then have some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, just a, a brief overview of how you can ask those questions. Um, on the side of your uh, screen, you should see in your little control panel a questions box, and you can type your questions in there at any point during the, the webinar. Um, and uh, at the end of the webinar as well, you know, you'll be able to use the raise hand function. Um, so that's the uh, little icon that's circled there uh, on the, the slide. And with that, uh, we'll be able to flag you and then uh, let you actually speak on the, on the phone line or on your computer, however you're logged in. Um, uh, that'll only occur at the end, uh, but you can, as I said, type in your questions at any point during the, the presentation. Um, and just as a note for everybody, today's presentation is being recorded. So um, if you, uh, you know, th we want this to be a safe space for people to, to ask questions. If you uh, want your question to be kept anonymous um, by typing it in, um, only we at the Law Center will, will see that. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll see your name in, in any way attached to it um, so we can keep that anonymous and, and ask the question um, anonymously if, if you need that to be done. Um, but just so everyone's aware, uh, the, the, the webinar will be uh, posted on our YouTube site and part, become part of the Data Driven Justice Initiative Resource Bank um, as that is developed. So with that, um, uh, I'm going to start off with a poll. Uh, some of you who attended last time may have seen this then as well, um, but uh, we just want to find out a little bit more about how things are going in your community. So our proposals uh, to prohibit homelessness, um, or, or when public conversations are happening about homelessness, um, our proposals to prohibit um, more or less likely uh, than those uh, proposing constructive alternative solutions. Looks like uh, the results are that um, many more people are seeing more prohibitions um, than addressing the underlying causes. So clearly, we've got work to do on, um, on today's call, but hopefully our, our presenters were participating as well, and they, they'll be able to share some of the, the solutions that they have. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Alan Witchie, uh, the Executive Director for the Coalition for Homelessness, CHIP, um, in, uh, in Indianapolis to talk a little bit more about their really exciting work, um, uh, especially around uh, ending homeless encampments through providing uh, adequate housing and other services. Alan, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I'm the executive director at CHIP, or the Coalition for Homelessness Intervention and Prevention. And our organization is um, the backbone organization in Indianapolis on our collective efforts to end homelessness. So we do uh, community planning, um, advocacy and education work. We do capacity building for our nonprofit partners, a lot of uh, research and evaluation. Um, as well as data um, collection and analysis um, from the collective M uh, standpoint. We're the HMIS uh, lead entity. So on the uh, next slide, you'll hear just a little bit about the homeless situation in Indianapolis. Um, we have about over 3,000 um, kids under 17 on any given day. Uh, who are uh, doubled up home or d directly homeless in the shelters. We have about uh, one in five that are veterans of our homeless, one in four with mental illness, and, and uh, um, about 2,500 um, that are living in places unfit for human habitation. On the uh, next slide, you'll just get a little bit of a sense of how our homeless has uh, shifted over 10 years. We haven't had um, a, a great impact on our shelters. We've seen the increases there and increases with veterans. Um, and in terms of unsheltered homeless, it's really been very consistent. And um, many of our families, uh, the need around families has, has um, really been consistent. We have 
uh, but though made some great um, decreases in total homelessness and decreases in transitional housing. But still, annually, we have around nine to 10,000 homeless here in our community. On the next slide, you will see um, kind of the situation that we were talking about here today, um, which was in about uh, 2000, 2015, um, we had um, probably uh, a, a situation in which we had um, not an adversarial relationship with our city and elected officials and police department, but not really the most positive. And so we had zero funding from the city to support homelessness, so all of our funding either came from private foundations or uh, from HUD directly. And then we had this sort of community rift that had happened when uh, we had a fairly large encampment, maybe about 35, um, 40 people living there, that uh, the police really broke up, the city broke it up, and uh, there were a couple people arrested, but most people were evicted and, and just sort of moved on. Um, and we uh, had really a very common occurrence was to um, incarcerate um, our homeless, and um, we really have a very you know, large, sort of in terms of the community, part of the reason that was happening is that we had a very uh, large shortage of shelter space. We still have that with no low barrier shelters. So anybody with, who was intoxicated or using it in any way didn't really have any place to go at all. Um, we just didn't have enough housing options with uh, about 300 people regularly on our permanent supportive housing wait list. Um, and even more uh, on the list for other housing options. Uh, and, and really, on our unsheltered, it's very common for us to have mental health and addiction problems, especially in the chronic uh, homeless population. So on the next slide, you'll see that we really um, got excited around some of those things. We were able to leverage this breakup of this encampment to try to pass a basic Protections Act, which was, was Prop 12 for us. And it's good to know that prior year, we tried to get both this basic protections and a um, bill of rights passed. And it, we, uh, it ended up being vetoed by the mayor, although it passed the city county council. And um, it was a very controversial bill because of the bill of rights that was attached to it. And so the next year we came back and worked with a city county councilor um, that was a big um, advocate for us in trying to get the basic uh, protections part of it passed. And we were able to do that. And so in um, 2016, in January of 2016, we had that passed. And this just sort of summarizes what that looks like. And so now when the city is addressing um, a homeless encampment or anyone who's living on the streets, there are sort of steps that they have to do. So they have to provide notice um, to the continuum of care, to the nonprofit sector and the service providers, which they didn't have to do before. They could um, very covertly, very quickly move on, um, move on on people who were in encampments, but now they're, they're not allowed to do that. Um, and also required people to, the, for the city to catalog and store personal items because we knew that that was a frequently an issue is when someone was arrested or displaced, they lost their personal items. Um, and then it also required that um, permanent supportive housing or transitional housing be available for someone if they desired it. So that it, in, instead of putting somebody in jail or, or just moving them to a new location, they had to have a housing option available. Um, and then there was this uh, wait until the, the, the option is available to um, peace that came around. And that was a bit controversial at first. But it basically, um, we were asking the city to sort of pause rather than just to move forward and say, hey, we're going to arrest somebody, evict somebody, just to pause for a minute while we can collect ourselves in the community and try to find solutions. Um, and then um, we, we also then put this part in about having the city give priority to long-term residents of the camp. And that was really um, 
a bit controversial even with some of our continuum of care providers because they were worried that was going to apply to them uh, where it didn't. It really was about, you know, like uh, the city housing authority saying, um, hey, we are going to work on a housing first strategy to try to get people housed if uh, they, they need it before we're, we were evicting them uh, from their camp. And so that was a huge um, step forward for us because our housing authority gave no, gives no preference to homelessness and had never been involved really with helping us in the homeless sector. And then the last part of the, the law really was about giving um, an emergency exemption for the city. So if there was a health hazard or a health issue, um, the city could move quicker than going through all these different pieces. I'm going to go to the next slide really quick. Um, the second part that came out of that, so the first part was this um, legislation, they're sort of going together, but the second part was uh, that finally getting the city to give money around homelessness and we uh, were very specific about what we wanted because there was in fact a, um, a really absence in our community around um, a place for homeless individuals who were intoxicated or using substances to go to because none of our shelters would allow them in. They're all faith-based shelters and they're all uh, require uh, sobriety to come in. Um, and so we uh, negotiated this deal and this ugly building in this picture is the jail on the bottom floor and then it had three levels of empty uh, facility above it. And so we got the second level given to us by the city and it was um, by far not the most ideal because we are in the same building as the, um, as the jail but we have separate entrance and separate organization and separate everything. Um, and basically this is a place uh, that we can have short-term shelter for homeless individuals that are intoxicated and living on the streets and we can put them through detox, um, medical detox treatment and then get them into um, a long-term supportive services um, and other housing options. And we did one of the key pieces that sold this was a study we had done to show that somewhere between three and almost eight million dollars was the cost annually that this population was um, for our city in terms of jails, um, court costs, and medical costs. Those were the three factors we looked at. And um, so if you go to the next slide, it really does um, just highlight that we are under construction right now in this facility. Uh, CHIP, our organization, we raised a lot of the construction funds to actually build it out because the city um, wasn't willing to do that and actually because we had those private dollars it was one of the ways we were help, able to help leverage the city to sort of pass this initiative and um, and the city is now going to do the ongoing operations and funding um, so it really is a collaborative effort with the city, the public health, um, nonprofit homeless providers and um, we're opening January 2nd 2017 on that and it's really been an exciting journey to see the evolution of our city from a place where um, it was a very reactive and maybe sort of a negative response to homelessness sometimes to now a very um, positive and exciting place where um, both in terms of laws and actual funding and implementation of programs we have city staff, city elected officials, um, really engaged in a meaningful way in trying to end this um, um, issue. And, and in fact, um, our city is, is um, we just, one thing I should have added here is that we just worked collaboratively to create a new um, position with the city, which is called the Special Assistant to the Mayor on, um, on Homelessness. And so it's, it's a city um, position that we'll be hiring in 2017 that sole focus is on homelessness and making sure that um, the city county council, that the mayor, that um, the city staff are aware of homelessness and how we're trying to end it here in our community. Uh, so that's my presentation. I will turn it um, on to the next group. Thanks so much, uh, Alan. And um, again, I, I would just uh, emphasize when, when I first talked with Alan um, a little while ago, uh, you know, the the message that I got from him was that this uh, 
this ordinance, um, which would seem to, uh, in some ways, uh, eliminate options for the the um, the city. You know, they can't evict a a encampment until there's adequate alternative housing provided. Um, has instead, rather than being a limiting factor, has been um, a a catalyst for opening up new possibilities for getting this funding for this this shelter provi providing the need um, you know meeting the need that was in the community and other things so I think um, it just really shows that once you start down um, a more constructive uh, route then um, as people uh, kind of see that this way is, is the way that they have to go um, they find ways to make it uh, even better so um, thanks so much for that, Alan. Um, and now I will turn over to Paul and Melissa from Syracuse to talk about the good work that's going on there. Hi, thanks so much, Eric. Um, so the, um, we, just to preface, we're um, in upstate New York. Uh, it is very, very cold here. Uh, we get, you know, lake effect snow, and we win the golden snowball every year for, you know, the most inches of snow, and I'm sure Eric can attest to that as being a former Syracusean. Um, it tends to get, you know, we have some of, some days it goes down to, like, negative 20 degrees. Um, so with this, Governor Cuomo announced uh, in the, the first Sunday in January and put into place on Tuesday, uh, the Executive Order 151. And if you could do the next slide. Great. Okay. So um, I won't go ahead and read all of this, but I will say that basically, you know, when it's that cold outside, uh, they specifically said at 32 degrees or below, mm -hmm. including wind chill, people have uh, the ability or, you know, you could uh, have hypothermia, you're more at risk of hypothermia and death, and therefore we will need to take steps, local Department of Social Services, New York State Police, to bring people indoors. And so that includes involuntary placement. And so they evoked the um, mental hygiene law harming themselves or others to really be able to um, bring people indoors. And so, you know, this was Governor Cuomo, he's former HUD secretary, so there were great intentions that were behind this. Uh, it wasn't out of malice or anything like that, but, you know, with that they, they said um, that they'll provide any kind of services, uh, including shelter, case management services, street outreach funding, and to be honest, Syracuse has all of these services. Uh, a lot of places in rural upstate New York do not have it. So Syracuse is pretty fortunate that we are very much so service rich. So we're able to work together and really make sure that people who are outdoors are coming indoors when it is that cold outside and any other day, to be perfectly honest. So um, we did have an incident where we had one individual uh, who was refusing to come indoors and we were advised to um, contact state troopers, New York state troopers, and we were really afraid. You know, we um, have a really good system in place, and we were afraid that that person would lose trust in our street outreach providers. I don't have to tell anyone here who uh, that, you know, we really, street outreach, the, the backbone of it is to build trust with the people who are residing outdoors. And so, um, the the person ran, uh, there was a little bit of lack of trust, uh, but then we were able to get the person back and had a lot of conversations with that individual. We really tried to diversify our street outreach, so we are able to think creatively because we're so service rich uh, and brought in somebody from legal services um, who is a female and actually had a better touch with him and was able to um, inform him of his legal rights um, due to the executive order and after about a week or so he was convinced to to come indoors and so at that point we had no one who was living outdoors um, during that time period and you know we 
we work together with uh, Syracuse Police Department. We have an active and engaged outreach committee. So when this all happened, we really um, we convened and we changed uh, our outreach hours. Our street outreach providers changed their hours during any inclement weather and became way more communicative on these days to ensure no one was outside. Paul, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Well, yeah, I guess I would just go back to the, the week that the executive order was issued. There was a lot of tension in the city in terms of what would would happen if, when the city, if the city were to defy this law, which we eventually, or order, which we eventually did. But more than, I guess I wanted to, um, you know, kind of bring the, the law enforcement perspective into this, which I, I guess I found surprising. I'm the commissioner of neighborhood and business development, and uh, Chief Frank Fowler is my colleague. Um, but really, the you know the mayor is making these decisions, Mayor Stephanie Meyer, and and the dynamic that I kind of witnessed um, during this week and thereafter, the driving force for against this executive order really came from the police. Um, and really illustrated to me kind of this relationship that our local police force have with the unsheltered homeless in this community. Now, you know, when these very cold days happen, you know, we're all concerned about the health of the unsheltered, but typically we have a small unsheltered population throughout the year in more you know, milder temperatures. And to hear uh, from the police chief who is not, you know, he's a law and order guy. He's very tough on crime and I don't want to paint this picture of, you know, he's very, you know, left leaning or anything like that. But in this instance, he's using his law enforcement background to articulate to the mayor the damage that this executive order would cause in the trust that Melissa referred to between law enforcement and police. And he described this kind of un, uh, unspoken relationship between the police and these uh, unsheltered homeless throughout the year, and that the reason why um, many of these unsheltered choose to live just beyond kind of eyesight of the general population, like under bridges, and you know they don't move. Know, travel out into the rural hinterlands, they stay close to the urban centers, um, is, is uh, purposeful on both ends. And, and he, like I said, the police chief described this kind of dance between the two groups that they're kind of keeping an eye on each other throughout the, the year. And, you know, when, when police only really get involved when behavior turns criminal, but I hearken back to the beginning of this conversation about, you know, the, the activities of, of life-sustaining activities of where to put your, your backpack or, you know, where, do you, where to lie down or where to sit. Those non-harm-causing activities are tolerated and by our local police force because, A, you know, it's a diversion of their resources to address those life-sustaining activities, but it's also, you know, like leads to a more, um, you know, critical point when, when these folks do need medical help or some sort of emergency, um, they do come to the police and our, and the police force that kind of monitors this population have, are on a, almost a first name basis with many of these unsheltered homeless. So the fear was that if we followed this executive order that that trust would be broken, that we would drive these folks further away from the urban core or the right of way and thereby lose track of where they are, who they are, and only intervene in times of extreme crisis or, you know, death. So it, again, all I guess I'm just trying to uh, fill out the like the color commentator here in terms of the dynamic in our town that this push really is coming from law enforcement to decriminalize homelessness. Um, 
And you know, I'm, I, Melissa and I were talking. I mean, our mayor has a kind of a social work background in her family, so I think she's sympathetic to it. But really, um, it was the law enforcement community that was stressing uh, or, or reinforcing our approach to, uh, especially unsheltered homeless. And he, you know, he would admit that this position or this policy has evolved over time. You know, I, I, I also will uh, comment on Indianapolis breaking up uh, homeless encampments. This city went through a period of that as well with mixed results leaning towards negative. Um, so I think our current policy is born out of some of the failures that we have uh, applied in the past and we have now reached a point where we have this detente between the unsheltered homeless and our, and our law enforcement community that works um, even in even in times of really harsh weather. So I just wanted to provide that perspective and allow Melissa to continue here. You can see on the slide some of the uh, the press that we you know that our street outreach team and our uh, betraying. Uh, or uh, defying the governor's order had brought to this issue over time, but that's uh, generally our approach here in Syracuse, and it, se and it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next slide. Thanks, Paul. So, and then we have um, several street outreach providers. We have. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Thanks. We have in my father's kitchen. Uh, street Outreach, we have Rescue Mission, Homeless Intervention Services, Salvation Army has a Youth Street Outreach provider, uh, and all of those providers work with behavioral health providers and um, providers who are able to diagnose the CHANCE team uh, because getting a diagnosis is sometimes a barrier to getting into housing, um, and they go out together um, at least once a week with the behavioral health providers, so Hutchings Psychiatric Center, Syracuse Behavioral Health Care. Um, they will go out together and um, try and bring people in and really meeting people where they are because some of these behavioral health providers um, tend to be more, you know, come to me and make an appointment rather than meeting people where they are, which, which is outdoors. Um, our outreach committee is uh, meets monthly and it's comprised of shelter, outreach, mental health, substance abuse providers, as well as Syracuse City Police Department, very active and engaged officer who comes um, and actually presented at the, the last webinar that we did. Uh, downtown committee comes and we have the volunteer lawyers project as well. And so the local downtown committee became very invested and involved um, and their local security has also gone out with our street outreach providers. They also um, gave an award to uh, the Perfect Partner Award to two of our street outreach providers. And um, really, it was their commitment to them that, you know, we're going to continue this partnership. And they're really pleased with the, the kind of dedication that our street outreach providers um, have towards people who are experiencing homelessness outdoors. Um, so lots of meetings, you know, lots of creating buy-in. I think all of this, I would say, took about a year. You know, Paul mentioned the the encampment that was broken up. That was uh, September 2014, and then over the course of the next year, um, we really took the time to form this committee, form the trios model. Um, and a few months ago, that downtown committee award um, came about. And so, you know, I think part of it too had to do with HUD. Um, there is that, that question for the COC uh, people on the call. There is that question in the NOFA regarding criminalization of homelessness. And so, anytime something like that is brought up, whether it's panhandling or, you know, breaking up an encampment, um, I, I speak to that because you know we don't want to lose our, our housing funding, um, and 
that's really the tool to bring people indoors is to get them immediately off the streets and into housing. Um, a lot of the, the folks that we have, if you want to go to the next slide, are um, shelter resistant. So we have more than enough beds. Um, it's just the, the people that we have who are outdoors won't go indoors for many reasons, you know, whether it's um, the format of the shelter or, you know, if they have mental health or substance abuse concerns, things like that. Um, but our shelters, for the most part, do try and operate on a housing first perspective, um, the majority of them. And so this is basically all these, you know, articles here. This is what you have. This is what you get when you have a collaborative community approach. Um, and, you know, it's really important that uh, the lesson that we learned and um, I think that the, the state learned as well is to really trust uh, street outreach providers, trust human service providers. And because we're so service rich, you know, we do have that ability to think creatively and out of the box. Um, because of that collaborative approach, we were able to end um, veteran homelessness in Syracuse. Uh, the two articles in the middle, there was an individual who was sleeping outdoors for three years. Um, and for a lot of those three years, uh, he was sleeping outdoors uh, outside of City Hall. And uh, he is now doing street outreach with In My Father's Kitchen, which is one of our street outreach providers, and really providing that peer support. Um, so because, you know, sometimes they won't listen to what a human service provider has to say, and they'll, they'll listen to somebody who's actually experienced it. Um, because of our collaborative community approach, we've been able to decrease homelessness in, in almost every single pit count since 2009, 2010. Um, we were at over 600 people who were outdoors, and now we're down to a little bit under 400. We also had a statewide uh, H2 initiative to really integrate healthcare and homeless housing services, and that was a two-day workshop in Syracuse in April. So um, really bringing in other partners throughout the state, uh, our New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, the State Welfare Agency, is also very involved and invested. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that too. I guess I would just, you know, one final thought from my perspective, you know, to my colleague communities across the country, is that Melissa mentioned several times that we are a very service-rich community. Um, lots of uh, homeless service providers under the uh, what was a previous consortium called the Housing Homeless Task Force. Um, I think where we are seeing a lot of gains lately is that this was almost too loose a consortium and didn't really have um, a leader to, for all intents and purposes. It was a, a loose collection of homeless service providers coming together each year, writing the continuum of care application to HUD and, and, uh, and expending those funds. But in the in the past, recently, we this group decided to take some of its planning money and hire a director, and that director is Melissa. And now she's done a great job, but it's all. I would just urge my co colleague cities, if that if that isn't the case, to try to do that because, like I said, we have a lot of uh, incredible resources here, but they weren't aligning to. Uh, address some of these issues and for example the street outreach team that we had before was just one of the uh, homeless shelters uh, driving a van around at night and just bringing that that kind of um, assistance to the unsheltered homeless but through you know the experience that Melissa mentioned with that breaking up of the encampment and some of the other uh, you know, events that occurred over time, we realized we needed to round out that outreach team with mental health professionals and bring in some, you know, I guess some unorthodox players that were kind of doing this out of, you know, their own conscious, but bringing them into the fold and, and kind of rounding out that uh, street outreach team is one example of where a director of a 
continuum of care or the, in our case the housing homeless task force really can uh, lead what was once a loose consortium in to address a specific need and um, and Melissa has become kind of like the the main advisor to both the city the mayor and the county exec um, here and so, so it's really helpful to have an individual or a leadership role um, that's permanent uh, to help guide and and address some of the on-the-fly issues that both unsheltered and sheltered homeless uh, deal with. So that would be my bit of advice. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, I appreciate it, and thank you, <coughs> Melissa. Um, and you know, it's just great to see that in many communities, it's you know the business community that's pushing for criminalization, saying you know do something about homeless people on the streets. Um, you know, we have to ban handling, we have to ban sitting on the streets. But here, um, the collaborative approach that you guys have taken, you know, ends up getting the, the uh, homeless coalition and, and the outreach workers an award from the downtown business community. So I, I think that just shows that when you take these steps, um, you know, it, uh, the, the rewards can be uh, immediate, both in terms of the, the people who are actually getting off the streets, but also um, the reversal of some of those political pressures that many communities might, might feel. Um, so thank you uh, to both you guys um, for, for sharing all that. Uh, and we'll move on to um, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and guys, we're running a little behind schedule, so we'll try and keep it moving. All right? <laughs> OK, thank you, Eric. This is Jeff Youngman. Um, and I do see we're way behind schedule. So uh, I was going to talk a little bit about how um, our homeless problem with uh, the encampment started. But I think we'll just cut that out, other than to say that in 2013, uh, ourselves from the uh, 180 Place Homeless Justice Project in the ACLU challenged the city of Charleston's ordinance against panhandling. Uh, we got the panhandling ordinance changed, which allowed <clears throat> people that before would have been cited for panhandling allowed to panhandle. Uh, the public reaction of that was amazing in that everybody hated the idea. <laughs> um, people went nuts about the people that were now in the street corners panhandling. Uh, so the ordinance was changed again, which caused people that were panhandling and earning money to live in hotels or motels to then have to turn to encampment. So um, that uh, picture there that you see are, are pictures of the encampment. Uh, we had at one point 120 individuals at least living in, in various encampments under these bridges in an area of Charleston that led right into the downtown tourist area. So not only were they encamped, they were encamped in a place that nobody in the city wanted to encamp because all the tourists coming into Charleston would see them. And of course, you know, the city didn't want people to know that we had homeless people here in Charleston, so <clears throat> they wanted to do away with the encampment. So um, Anthony, I'm going to let him take over because he's the one that really spearheaded the effort uh, with 180 Place and with the city to, to resolve this encampment in a way that was humane, in a way that allowed everybody that was in the encampment to make a choice as to what kind of housing they would want. So. Go ahead, Anthony. Hi, I'm Anthony. I'm with Low Country Homeless Coalition. We're the CSC lead agency. And um, so the public reaction to the encampment was quite the opposite from the panhandling ordinance. Um, pretty soon after the um, encampment was pretty much at full size, there were um, just community members, concerned community members, uh, lots of faith-based organizations. Um, just dropping off food and clothing uh, almost every day um, in, in large amounts. And it really got to a point of uh, unsustainability. Um, so while it was still growing, I brought together local homeless service providers, um, local government representatives, police department, faith-based organizations, and some of these concerned um, citizens who had grouped up that were providing these daily needs for people um, to try to get more collaboration and to try to understand that this approach was really just making um, the encampment more entrenched and not providing a real means to end homelessness there. It was just helping people live more comfortably homeless. Um, 
And so there was some momentum there. We realized very soon after that that we needed an alternative place for people to be able to go that wasn't the encampment. Um, and so at that point, um, Charleston's mayor, Mayor Tecklenburg, uh, stepped in and uh, really helped spearhead this effort. And so there was a couple of important things that happened. First, you know, his commitment to having a solution that was humane was, was, was hugely uh, important in this. Um, he brought the city police to, into the picture in a meaningful way as well. And they were um, just great to work with. They had great relationships with people in the encampment. Um, they went out almost every day and knew people on a first name basis as well. Um, as you can see, well, in a later slide, but this is fine, you can stay here. Um, you can go to the next slide, actually. So pretty soon we realized that the uh, we needed to have jurisdiction over the property, the city did, so they actually worked with the DOT, and this was an important um, step logistically for helping the community come to a place where we could um, have more um, just collaboration together and work together to, uh, to to see an end of people needing to live there or having to live there. So they, the city actually worked with the DOT and they actually were able to lease the property to the city so that the local um, police department had jurisdiction on this property. After that happened, they set a goal of moving everybody out of the encampment by a certain date. And that may seem a little bit harsh and, cr and criminalizing oriented, but they, it, this was just, it really did help to provide an urgency to the situation and it really helped bring together homeless service providers, the city, um, and local property owners and landlords and really provided an urgency to have a housing goal. And that was really important to have both of those things going. Um, the mayor really focused on having a housing goal to the solution. Um, so we did experience a little bit of the classic uh, prioritizing people who were in the encampment effect of an encampment. Um, but we were able to get, you know, 22 people went to an emergency shelter from the encampment. Um, about 23 went directly into permanent supportive housing from the encampment. And then the remainder of people um, were able to, um, to go to a transitional housing center, which was set up um, in partnership with the city uh, mayor and the North Charleston city mayor and the county um, to provide a temporary place for people to go. And that was really important because, again, they didn't want to have to make any arrests for the people remaining there after um, we exhausted all of our housing resources. There were still a number of people there. And having this option really made the, the process um, much more smooth. So no arrests were made. Um, you can go to the next slide. And um, once people were in the housing transition center, the mayor spearheaded weekly meetings that he was a part of, and they had a, we had a housing plan set up for every single member of the transition center, very similar to the types of housing plans that COC providers do, but it was um, really a first time working with the city and working with the police department. They were part of these co uh, case conferencing meetings and we saw a lot of great success with that. The city being a part of this put some great um, pressure on local property owners to lower barriers into housing. And um, this urgency was really, was really important in this. Uh, there were some good and bad outcomes. The, good outcomes where we found pretty quick housing outcomes for almost everybody, but the, some of the negative effects were um, all the support services that people really needed and weren't necessarily there to begin with. So we kind of had to scramble a little bit and we learned a lot, a really good lesson from that, but um, that urgency was really important. And so finally, after that, the follow-up was that um, the mayor has com uh, created a commission um, on homelessness um, and there's been a lot of good momentum there with the commission. Uh, they want to really understand homelessness better. Uh, this was really the first opportunity, the first time that the city and local governments really came face to face with the issue and how severe the issue could be. And they want to move forward with getting a consulting firm to come into Charleston and the surrounding areas to do a full assessment of our resources, of our housing market, and really help us to provide a clear goal towards ending homelessness. Um, and the mayor, in the meantime, also to help with the housing, uh, housing solutions for the people in the housing transition center, set up a fund um, that the community helped to support. And this provided rapid rehousing funding um, in, the, in the interim to help people get into housing. So those are kind of the, the main takeaways that 
we did see a benefit from actually setting an end date goal, which provided urgency and helped get um, new players to the table, like property owners lowering their barriers. And, and the mayor did support setting up a, um, a fund and a commission to help going forward so that this never happens again. So that's about it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, um, really uh, fantastic to see uh, an encampment of that size uh, uh, dealt with um, and people gotten into permanent housing um, or other shelter uh, yeah. you know, without the use of, of any arrests or anything like that. So, uh, and again, uh, coming out with some long-term benefits as well as the, the immediate-term ones. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Sam quickly um, and uh, keep it rolling. Yeah. Hi, guys. This is Sam Dodge calling from San Francisco. Quite different than Syracuse and others. Uh, it's pretty nice and sunny and warm today, as it is most day in the year, and it's um, really affected how street homelessness is in California in general. Uh, single adults are about 70% on shelter. And this is really true in San Francisco where we have large encampments regularly that we're needing to approach and to address. There's been changes in the law where, um, you know, there's a statewide initiative, Prop 47, that'll, that will largely decriminalized um, personal drug use, including injection drugs uh, like heroin and methamphetamine, that they don't have the criminal penalty that they used to. And police are very much embraced that. Um, and that's had some great effects with reductions in our jails, but it's uh, made street level encampments and the conflict between neighbors and uh, street homeless people pretty intense. And one of our uh, approaches has been to open up a low threshold shelter uh, called the Navigation Center and now we have multiple of them and this is the entrance uh, to our original one which is at 1950 Mission Street if you know San Francisco it's right in the heart of the Mission District and it's an old uh, surplus school site that's slated to be developed into permanent affordable housing and we were able to get in there in the interim we have a long planning process to be able to use the space and do some minor upgrades so that it could be very usable. So we'll go to the next slide. Like I said, San Francisco, we've got a lot of street homeless people. We see that 3,500 number. This has been relatively consistent for the last 10 years, despite um, bringing on lots of supportive housing and trying to be very creative. But we have a very small shelter system, about 1,200 shelter beds for single adults. Uh, next slide. So um, the navigation center is just in the raw numbers. We, you know, we only opened the first one in the mission in uh, March uh, uh, 2015. We've um, been able to really help uh, a lot of people. Um, we uh, do have a large amount of supportive housing in the city. About. Uh, 6,500 units, um, but they weren't being made available to those that were um, not engaged in our shelter and other services, even though we were trying to target them for the longest term homeless and the most vulnerable. Um, the, the nature of their kind of disengagement with the system has made it hard. So Navigation Center, you know, the idea is it's aligning with our overall coordinated entry and access programs. Next slide. So here's going over some of the approaches that we built in here. You know, um, I previously worked in New York City and we had us kind of programs called safe havens, low barrier threshold, shelters that uh, were um, accessed only through the homeless outreach team. And so uh, one of the main uh, driving functions uh, is that, uh, that worked in New York and has worked here is that um, there is no curfew. And I know that's a radical thing for people to kind of understand, but we did some other things that was that um, a lot of people, you know, haven't tried before that I know of in a mass scale, which is like mixed gender dorms. Couples could come in, they could push their beds together, they could cuddle at night. That was not a problem. It, you know, um, people can bring their pets and all their possessions. We work with people to um, be able to downsize to where they can move into uh, apartments. 
um, or into the other systems of care. Um, but there's a lot of learning we tried to pack into there and experiment with. And when another part, which uh, I think people uh, appreciate, is that um, it's a pretty small shelter, 75 people at a time, and we do not have any uh, uniform security or any wanding, and we have not had any major incidents. Uh, and, and, you know, it's very mellow in there because of the lack of lines, because of the lack of curfews, because of the lack of security personnel. Everyone has a role in security, but as you know, when things really jump off, you're going to need to call the cops because your security personnel can only go so far. And here in San Francisco, they can't put their hands on anyone or anything like that. So um, it really is a big saver of the budget and allows you to have more staff on hand that help with the overall um, you know, service work and have a real legitimate relationship with people to be able to um, de-escalate situations. And all of this really helps to telegraph to the people on the street, this is something different, and this is something that we are going to respect. You are going to make your big life change. You're going to make this radical life change, and we're going to try to create a space that's accepting and warm, and it's going to make these opportunities real for you. Go to the next slide. So this is the original one. And go to the next slide. This is a second navigation center we opened just in June. It's uh, in an old residential hotel that's slated to be demolished. And so it could be two to four years. And so this was a good use of the space. Next slide. Um, our local political leadership got very excited about Navigation Center, seeing all the results, and we did a lot of like transparency with um, how we were working, and that got a lot of interest. And so the local leadership asked us to open six additional ones. A little bit of misunderstanding about how this sits in the middle of a larger system, but um, there is a need for more uh, shelter expansion. We hadn't had any ability to expand shelter because of community opposition to shelters in general. Um, for a decade. So um, now we're looking to open a third one and go to the next slide. And then uh, a fourth one that we're, uh, that we're working on that will be a little bit bigger. And then go to the next slide. It's kind of the layout of where they are around the city of San Francisco. I realize that it's about 11 right now. Um, so um, you know, we did another kind of part is to really bring in a lot of the data and where we, um, what we were doing, how we were doing it, and try to learn as we were going. I think, like many of you explained, we have large encampments. We have had a lot of learning through doing, and you can't really stop and wait for a perfect solution. And navigation centers has been like kind of an open book trying to learn about how we're approaching encampments and how we're working with people that are trying to change their lives out of encampments and get back into housing. So I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, uh, it's great to see um, the really constructive use of uh, vacant properties um, that would otherwise have gone unused um, in being part of the solution here. I think there's a lot of those in, in our communities. And if they can be turned into something that uh, you know, is just temporary, but keeps the system working and the system going, then um, then that can be helpful in, in reducing community opposition, the nimbyism that comes with a lot of these, um, but then also uh, actually making a dent in the overall uh, problem. So while I'm running through the rest of your slides here, thanks for uh, keeping yours uh, concise. Um, I'll go on to Elisha. I recognize that we are already pushing over time, um, but we'll, uh, we'll keep on going for those of you who can stay on the call. Uh, I appreciate your, your indulgence. And um, the full uh, webinar will be uh, available probably in two or three days, um, maybe next week. Uh, we'll send out the link to the recorded one that, for anybody who needs to jump off. But uh, for those who don't, uh, here's Elisha. Thanks, Eric. Uh, appreciate the National Law Center having um, NLC on this call. 
and webinar and uh, want to give uh, just an overview of not only who the National League of Cities uh, is, uh, but who our members are and what we are trying to do to encourage uh, our members to take a more proactive um, position on how homelessness is dealt with in their communities. Uh, so you can go ahead to that next slide. And just uh, some brief background uh, information. Uh, you see that our mission there is, is to help city leaders build better communities and that's really on the watershed of all issues uh, that impact municipalities. And so I lead our work on veterans issues and on homelessness issues uh, here at the National League of Cities. You can go to that next slide. We connect to all cities across the country through 49 state municipal leagues. Um, so uh, here in the D.C. area, for example, there is the Virginia Municipal League, which represents all cities to uh, the state legislature in Richmond. Um, uh, but then we also have members, uh, such as all of those on the call today, who are direct members of the National League of Cities. And so on behalf of our members and of all cities through the state municipal leagues, uh, we provide not only advocacy, but also research and technical engagement. You can go to that next slide. So our, our role on uh, homelessness uh, has really focused uh, for the last uh, three to four years on veteran homelessness. And we have been the lead partner with the administration on the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness. Um, and there on the right, you can see our executive director, Clarence Anthony, signing a memorandum of understanding uh, with Secretary Castro on the mayor's challenge. Uh, you can go to that next slide. As a result, uh, we've been able to support the administration in the, um, in the recruitment and the retention of local leader participation on the Mayor's Challenge. And you can see that to date, uh, there are nearly 900 local elected officials who have uh, signed on to the challenge. And you can see uh, those types of elected officials that, have, uh, part, are, that are participating in the challenge and the fact that they're across 45 states uh, and D.C. and Puerto Rico. Uh, next slide. Really one of the biggest things that we are trying to push out as an alternative um, to, to criminalization and as a way to proactively become engaged on homelessness is to recognize that mayors and, and elected officials can use their positions in communities uh, to really help uh, attract the needed stakeholders uh, to the table. Um, to partner with those folks who are on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with homelessness in the community and recognizing that they can't do it by themselves, that they do need the support of the community. And so in a very specific way, uh, after doing regional forums across the country in support of the Mayor's Challenge, we recognized a unique need uh, for landlord engagement uh, to really help recruit landlords to house uh, homeless veterans, those who have housing vouchers. And so uh, we've been fortunate to be able to begin doing this type of landlord engagement in a number of communities uh, across the community. You can see there on the left, Mayor of Tucson, Jonathan Rothschild, and on the right there, Mayor uh, Roberts from Charlotte uh, at an event that we did just back in October. Uh, you can go to that next slide. We were fortunate to be able to do one of these events, actually our first event for this in Charleston with Anthony and his uh, team down uh, there. And at the time, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg had recently been elected into office, but he had not yet taken office. And so uh, you heard from Anthony about uh, the importance that the mayor saw for in dealing with the encampment that he saw for there to be a housing outcome or a housing goal. Uh, to how they were dealing with that situation. And, and he really seemed to get this very early on. He participated in our landlord engagement event down there, uh, brought his wife to the event, and really seemed to, from a very personal level, understand the importance of his engagement on that as an elected official. Um, and so the timing of that really worked out well in Charleston. Uh, the mayor not only came to that event in December of 2015, but then as you uh, will recall from Anthony, uh, Anthony's presentation that that really was just before and as that encampment issue was ramping up and so uh, really enabled the mayor uh, elect and, and soon to be Mayor Tecklenburg to, to, to play a, a leading role in, in, um, 
in recruiting landlords and recognizing the importance of uh, there being uh, a housing component to how they dealt with the issue. Um, we have continued to do landlord engagement events in the communities you see there. Uh, we'll be going down to Orlando uh, next month and we will be doing landlord engagement events um, in four other communities over the course of 2017. You can find uh, a brochure that summarizes some of the best practices that we are learning uh, at nlc.org slash mayor's challenge. You see the copy of that uh, brochure uh, there on the left. Next slide. I'll run quickly through a, a, a few other things that um, we really try and encourage our members uh, and participants in the Mayor's Challenge uh, to recognize that they can be doing uh, in their communities on veteran homelessness and of course that uh, relates to all forms of homelessness. Uh, you heard, of course, uh, from Alan about the, the innovative ordinance out there in Indianapolis. And one of the reasons why we thought this was a particularly important ordinance to look at uh, was that, as Alan really detailed, it, it establishes rules of the road uh, for the city's response, rather than allowing a, a more reactive and potentially arbitrary response uh, to encampments. And we really felt that that was an important precedent uh, for communities to understand and to look at. Uh, and so that's featured on our uh, website there that, have, that you can see. Um, next slide. Of course, then you heard from Paul and Melissa about the importance of proactive police engagement there in Syracuse, but we also uh, are seeing examples in other communities like Wichita, Kansas. And, you know, Paul really uh, spoke in, in detail about the diversion of resources that, you know, not having a more proactive police engagement uh, can, can allow to happen and the trust that it allows to uh, develop between unsheltered uh, members of the homeless community and the police department. And one of the things that we really try and push out is that as communities are developing the best practice of a by name list, um, it is difficult particularly for those who are unsheltered to be um, found once they have been matched with a resource. And that's particularly why the role of proactive police engagement is important, is that it can help not only with getting people into the system, but then once the system um, is coordinated, uh, that they can then uh, feed back out uh, and the police can help identify people that have been matched with a resource. So we really encourage people to look at Syracuse and, uh, and Wichita. In fact, uh, Mayor Minor highlighted uh, the work that their police uh, department in Syracuse was doing at the White House event on the Mayor's Challenge uh, just two weeks ago here in D.C. You can go to that next slide. Uh, Sam, Paul, and Alan, um, you know, all in some way, shape, or form mentioned just the role that having uh, a key point of, of contact uh, at the city uh, has played in the progress that they've seen in their communities. And we've seen this in other communities. You know, I named Tucson, New Orleans, and Houston here. Uh, but, but just the simple fact that folks in, uh, from San Francisco and Syracuse are city um, city officials and are playing such a lead role um, as they're talking about today and that Alan mentioned with Melissa's position um, uh, or I'm sorry Alan mentioned a new city position uh, that they are putting in place and the importance of that um, so we really are encouraging uh, local elected officials uh, to do just that to put a city employee in place uh, that can help with the overall uh, community's uh, coordination on an ongoing basis the next one. A couple of last things quickly is uh, we're encouraging uh, uh, officials to look at the examples of people like Mayor Garcetti uh, who are helping in LA with moving kits. Next slide. Really encouraging people, and our, our uh, mayors participating in the Mayor's Challenge uh, to help engage missing stakeholders, particularly as it relates uh, to when uh, communities get to the point where they can identify where new people coming into the homeless system are coming from. Is that prisons? Um, where is that? Um, you know, and 
beginning to bring those stakeholders to the table uh, so that we can talk about really trying to mitigate the inflow of people to the homeless system. Next slide. If you can go to that next slide. Okay, when we get to that next slide, th thank you. Um, we also are encouraging communities to look at some of the municipally held property that they might have um, so that it can be connected to uh, some of the community's nonprofit developers um, to develop permanent supportive housing and other types of house affordable housing. Um, go, if you can go back one slide. As it relates to affordable housing development, uh, we have also highlighted the role that uh, cities can have in really helping to align some of the affordable housing resources that are out there, whether they be not only city controlled, uh, but also those resources that are um, uh, held and, and administered by the county and by the state. So really engaging with county and state officials to help align those resources. So all of these are some specific examples that we are trying to push out to elected officials um, as alternatives uh, to alternative courses of action that they can be taking in their communities that can really make an impact. And I think the big message that we try and push out to uh, community stakeholders that are working on homelessness on, on a daily basis is that we hope they will use the mayor's challenge as a mechanism and a platform for engaging with uh, their mayors uh, who we hope are participating in it, but really that when uh, engaging with uh, local elected officials, it, it is our experience that these are folks who are incredibly busy on a day-to-day -day basis. And so really being able to come to the table with these types of very specific, pragmatic, concrete examples of action that they can take um, is really a, a, a game-changing um, element to a conversation with a local elected official rather than just coming to the table and asking for their support or asking for them not to do uh, one course of action. Uh, but again, coming to the table and explaining and contextualizing why uh, going down this other road and perhaps taking some of these alternative actions are a better course of action for the city versus uh, perhaps going down the road of criminalization. So um, I hope that's of, of, of some help to folks and uh, look forward to any questions that there might be. My contact information is there and would welcome um, anyone to reach out to, to me following the webinar. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, um, Elisha. Um, uh, and uh, just to flag for folks, um, our next uh, DDJI webinar will be on uh, Thursday, January 19th, uh, 2 p.m., and it'll have a lot more of these housing law and policy solutions uh, that we've been able to collect from across the country, um, and so we encourage people to, to sign into that. Additionally, at the Law Center um, is putting on two larger uh, webinars, uh, not just for the DDJI communities, um, uh, that you can sign up for uh, that are both uh, taking place in the coming weeks. And um, those will have uh, many of the similar points that have been made today, but uh, uh, new ones as well. So if you like what you heard today um, and have other people in your communities, um, whether they be uh, service providers or uh, administration folks or other elected officials um, or members of the business community, um, you can definitely encourage them to sign up for uh, these webinars and, and come and hear about these, uh, these great solutions. Um, so. We'll do one more quick uh, set of polls here, and then we'll um, wrap up with uh, some questions and answers. Um, so here, uh, uh, um, wanted to uh, ask, um, will the information that you learned today help you achieve the goals of the DDJI in your community? <coughs> Go ahead and click on your answers. Give it a few more seconds. All right. And 
looks like uh, everybody learned a little something today that will uh, help them in that work. And then the last one, um, we are pretty flexible in our schedule for upcoming webinars. Um, we have some that are planned, um, but we want to know uh, what would be of most use to you in the community um, that we could be sharing more of. So um, go ahead and select from the options on the screen. If there's something else uh, that you would want us to see, want to see us cover, you can feel free to type that in the chat box. Or if you like more than one, you can select one that uh, jumps out first at you, but then feel free to, to add additional uh, items into the chat box as well. So I'll give that a couple more seconds. All right. And it looks like a, a pretty wide uh, variety of folks um, looking for cost studies, more examples, um, some more discussion on the law, and um, some communications uh, talking points, uh, which we know can definitely help. So we'll, uh, we'll try and focus on some of those in upcoming uh, webinars. So thanks uh, for all of that. And um, again, here's all the contact information for everybody who uh, presented today. Um, Janelle, if you can let us know if there's any questions out there. Yes, yeah, so we do have just a couple of questions. Um, the first is related to um, Indianapolis, and uh, the question asker would like to know more about how the data and information was collected in Indianapolis. Um, which data in particular? Was it the data on the cost study, maybe? Um, we worked with, on the cost study, we worked with a um, university uh, department, the department to uh, which the research uh, public policy institute to actually look at some of the high end users in because we had um, HMIS our homeless information management system we were able to look at some of the people that were chronically homeless for longer periods of time and look at how often they were accessing medical records which we cross-reference with um, our our local public health department and then also uh, worked with the local um, justice system to try to figure out how often they were accessing services there. Part of it was a collaborative uh, with providers as well so if somebody was look, uh, seeing uh, the same client over and over again they were um, uh, we were, would sort of earmark that client um, now that study was done a few years ago and we are in the process of doing a more comprehensive next year we're going to do a more comprehensive study as well and look at some of the the even the, the um, broader costs associated with uh, people staying homeless and what that is uh, truly for our community so it's I think our original cost study was re really very good but uh, we have since learned uh, some new things and new ways to do it, so we're we're gonna um, repeat that study again next year. More confidence. Great. Great, thank you. And then they have a follow up. Um, they're curious about how you identified the different subpopulations. Was that through the pit count or for, through your HMIS intake or otherwise? We looked at both in HMIS data and then also, as I mentioned, worked with individual providers. So if a provider was saying, oh, this client, I see them all the time, um, we were able to kind of look at that, pull records from that specific client as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll move on to the next question, which um, sort of builds off of um, the Navigation Center in San Francisco. There's some interest in um, looking at ways that um, you know, communities can identify vacant property that could be used for homeless services. Um, and so I wonder if folks could talk about that. And I'll, I'll also tap for this question, um, Tristia Bauman here at the Law Center to talk about the Title V program as well. Yes, hi Janelle, uh, this is Tristia. I am happy to talk about Title V as uh, a mechanism by which 
cities, states, and nonprofit agencies that provide homeless services can obtain surplus federal property uh, at no charge for title to that property. Um, Title V of the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act uh, is a law that has been in place now for uh, over 25 years, and the law provides a right of first refusal to unneeded federal properties um, which are published and advertised in the Federal Register every Friday and then held for 60 days if interest is expressed by an eligible service provider. And as I said, that can include a state, local government, or nonprofit agency that can demonstrate it will be providing needed homeless services in a given community. That can include uh, emergency shelter um, so that it can be used, for example, to uh, have a navigation center style shelter in your community. It can also be used for permanent supportive housing. There's currently legislation pending in Congress that has passed through the House and that is expected to pass through the Senate that will allow the properties to be used for permanent housing um, even without supportive services. And it can also be used uh, to expand capacity to provide services uh, like for example be used as uh, administrative office space for service providers. Uh, there is more information available on the Law Center's website about how to look for and apply successfully for properties under Title V, and I'd encourage anyone who's interested in thinking uh, through this to contact the Law Center and me specifically uh, to learn more about Title V. I, this is Alan in Indianapolis, too, and I just want to add a little bit to that. that it's um, we Our city is interested in and helping us ha you know, get more properties and, and uh, maybe even you know, a whole complex, of, an apartment complex of permanent support of housing and um, uh, maybe a low, uh, another um, full shelter that would be low barrier. But it is hard because even if they're willing to give you the property, there's a lot that has to go into thinking about ongoing um, you know, operations and and staffing and, and all the things that go with that. So when we worked with our city, um, we really started with the engagement center and said, I think this was a real need. And we had to, you know, also um, get the funds to, you know, rebuild the place so that it was actually managed that you that people could use it as a facility. And then, you know, we were able to convince the city to do the ongoing operations. But that's really hard. I don't think we can do that for every property. So. They're saying, like, what, what could you guys do? How could you pull together the ongoing operations? And, um, and, and that, that's just tough. So you've got to really have a good business plan in place. And this is Elisha with the National League. I think that's why uh, one of the slides that I had up there was the, uh, the pipeline. Um, and so if folks have the opportunity, I'd, I, I've, I've written some about uh, LA's affordable housing pipeline. Um, and that's why we really do encourage uh, cities to look at how they can uh, work with county and state uh, level folks to align those resources um, uh, to address exactly what, uh, what Alan's talking about right there. And that wraps up all the questions that we have at the moment. So I'll just encourage folks to send any additional questions uh, via email. Contact info for everyone is on the screen. Thanks so much, Nell. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with us as we ran a little bit over. Um, I'll, I'll let people go. Again, we've got uh, a lot more resources on our website. We encourage people to sign up and endorse our, uh, our Housing Not Handcuffs campaign um, and look there for more resources as well and to tune into our future webinars, uh, both the ones coming up uh, in the coming weeks here and then again on uh, January 19th for the next in the DDJI series. So thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks especially to our presenters. And we hope uh, we've been able to, to help people move forward and uh, success on the DDJI.